Nourit Pellet is a uh, professor at Nourit Pellet El Hanan, right? Correct. Okay, she, she is a professor of uh, language and education at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And she's the author of the book that she's going to um, talk about today, which uh, goes through the Israeli representation of Palestinians in Israeli school books. Now, this is a hot topic. It's been something that's been studied at governmental level. Um, the U.S. State Department, I think it was in 2011, issued a huge study on this topic on textbooks on both sides because this is used basically as a, um, as a point of propaganda. So right after the war in uh, 2009 in uh, Gaza, um, some prefer to call that a massacre, uh, I'll leave that to, to, to your judgment, but after that there was uh, Sipi Livni, who was a presidential candidate by then, who said the Palestinians teach their children to hate, we teach um, to, to love our neighbors. And that's uh, one of the myths that uh, uh, Nubit um, is, uh, goes through her book. She looks at, if I understand correctly, 17 school books. I haven't read the book myself either, so I'm looking forward to do so. Um, so that would be the topic of this afternoon, um, the subject of her book and the representations of Palestinians in Israeli textbooks. And uh, a little bit about Nurit herself. She is uh, also a, not just a scholar, but a scholar activist. She has been uh, dedicated to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and uh, uh, critici has criticized the uh, Israeli occupation for almost two decades now. She's the co-laureate, along with Palestinian um, novelist Izzat uh, Qazawi, yes, uh, who um, they won a, no, um, a Nobel, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, <laughs> the Sakharov Prize in 2001. And uh, she is also uh, a co founder of the uh, Russell Tribunal from 2009 till, uh, till this date, which is the uh, alternative uh, law tribunal that was uh, set down to, uh, to look at um, the Israeli um, um, human rights crimes and war crimes. And, the West Bank and also the Gaza Strip. And without further ado, I'll leave it open to Nubit. Thank you very much. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'll speak about really my study, which is in this book over there, uh, which is called Palestine and Israeli School Books, Ideology and Propaganda in Education. It was published in London in 2012. And in that, I really uh, examine the way Palestinians and Palestine are represented in Israeli school books. I started to look at school books from after Oslo, uh, because until then, there were a lot of studies, other studies, and I wanted to see if there was a change. And altogether, uh, five geography school book, 20 history, and five city studies. And um, I will show you a bit of what I found, and the rest will be in the book. Uh, I do have some, as you see, some quotes from other people about the, about the situation. This one is Achilles Membe, who wrote this, the book, Necropolitics, and he speaks about uh, Israel. And my question, my overarching question was um, uh, based on Fanon's uh, question, he asked how do the oppressive people behave? And I asked how do the oppressive people educate the children? Now, school books um, all over the world are meant to legitimate the state and its actions, including uh, what is called the founding crimes of the nation, and every nation has founding crimes, even Denmark, uh, and to reproduce some national narrative uh, with which uh, future generations can live their present and plan their future, which means they have to use what is called in the literature a usable past, a past that we can use uh, to go on. And Israeli school books, of course, for them, uh, the national narrative is formed around uh, the, um, uh, the Zionist ideology and the Zionist narrative, which is not the same as uh, Jewish narrative and is not the same as biblical narrative, it's something else altogether. 
and uh, they have they reproduce it uh, both in Jewish and Arab schools in Israel. And for the Jewish uh, students, one of the main things is to create a national territorial uh, identity. Of course, for the Arab students, is to make them forget uh, their own narrative. Um, in Israel, there's never been peace education or conflict resolution education or any way to tackle the problem of conflict and peace. Uh, not formally, there are many private initiatives of schools that do that, mixed schools and this and that, but officially from the ministry, we never had any, uh, any such program. Because uh, the, uh, the main objective is really to make the to impose the, the Zionist uh, narrative on all the population. And this is very typical, as you see in this quote, to ethnocratic states. And really, Israel has succeeded so far in advertising itself as a democracy, but it is really defined by uh, scholars as an ethnocracy, because there's one ethnicity that has more privileges than other ethnicities. So you cannot, uh, and there's half the population with no human rights whatsoever, so you cannot call it really democracy. But it's very typical of democracies to uh, impose their cultural and religious symbols and to and their narrative and to silence, ridicule, or even uh, suppress altogether uh, all other perspectives. So I don't know if you know that when we talk about Israeli culture, or Israeli literature, or Israeli economy, or Israeli agriculture, it's only Jewish. The Arab citizens are not included in any of it. If you speak about theater in Israel, it's, it's about the Jewish theater, nobody speaks about the Arab theater. Okay. Now, in order to comply with the Zionist um, hypotext, of, of everything. The books, uh, books in Israel are private industry. They are trade books, there are hundreds of school books, and teachers can choose whatever they want. But all the books have to be authorized by the Ministry of Education, and that means that they have to have some common ground and basic assumptions, which again derive from the Zionist ideology and narrative. So some of them are existentials which means what exists. So children in Israel learn that there's anti-Semitism, Arab hatred and threat, Jewish historical rights on the land of Israel and Palestine, of course. When we say the land of Israel, we include not only Palestine, but only pieces of Jordan, pieces of Lebanon, and pieces of Syria. But uh, all the maps in Israel, if you look at any map of the tourist uh, information or hospitals or banks or whatever, show you the land of Israel, which really includes not much more than the state of Israel. Israel's Arabs fly from the land, they can. Israel's Arabs abandoned the villagers, refused the, the partition plan, and fought Israelis to perdition. These are things that you don't discuss, it's something that is there, like I don't know, like Jesus in a Catholic school, you don't argue about it. Okay. Uh, proposition assumption, what can or will be the case? Palestinian citizens constitute a demographic problem which can become a demographic threat or even nightmare in some of the books. And Palestinian in the occupied territories are a constant threat and must be controlled at all times. And this is very strong in Israeli discourse and mentality. Even people who are educated, who are university professors, I was just now in another conference about writing, and my colleagues from the university speak like that. Okay? If we don't control them, they'll slaughter us. If, uh, so on and so on. It's very deep, uh, and it's, it, it is not to be discussed. Also, it is not to be proved, because how can you prove it? A value assumption, what is good and desirable, Jewish state, Jewish majority, and Israeli control. This is very, very important. The highest principle in Israel is to have a Jewish majority. So some governments are more blatant about how to do it, and some governments are less, but uh, it is the major, uh, the major objective, the major principle. Now, this sort of, rate of nationalism, of course, creates racism, what is called today differential racism or cultural racism or national racism, as you see from these quotes. Um, 
and of course, racism today is is uh, is not uh, is not um, limited to to what uh, we call biological racism. It's it's much it's much uh, larger. Like what Vodak says, racism, nationalism, sexism, ethnicism—they are all the same. It's all under racism. So in Israel, uh, children of Israel are really educated in a very racist discourse. Uh, even small talk is racist. I mean, when you come there, they ask you immediately, are you Jewish or not Jewish? And if you're Jewish, are you Arab or not Arab? And if, if you're not Jewish, and if you're Jewish, are you a European descendant or an Oriental descendant? And this is not considered uh, racism. This is it. All right? Um, and of course, this racism inscribes itself in the practices everyday practices, yes? We see today, you know, in Israel there is raging racism in the streets and attacks against Arabs and uh, one boy was even burned and only two days ago a settler ran over another child, I think it's already 20 in this year, that settlers ran over children, Palestinian children, and killed them. And uh, all these things cannot exist, I mean, Street racism cannot exist if it doesn't have an institutional racism to support it. And all this in order really to, to so to speak, keep the, the purity of the race. How is this justified in the, in the books? So this is a book uh, of uh, civic studies for matriculation and this is what they say. There is no contradiction between the fact that Israel is comprised of a civil nation of citizens and the fact that several ethnocultural minorities live in it, but the only nation that enjoys self-determination is the Jewish one. So this kind of putting things, there is no contradiction, that is it. Okay? Such phrasing does not let you, does not open any opening for discussion. This is it, then. it's fine. Uh, Palestinians, as you know, live in what is called a state of exception, which is usually a state that people live in after the war, when they are neither here nor there, and it should last a very short time. But in Israel it lasts at least 48 years, if not uh, 767 years. And that means that people don't have any legal status, any legal rights. And they cannot defend themselves, they cannot go to any court, they cannot uh, ask for any help, uh, they cannot even determine their own life, their own movements, or so on. So Palestinians have been living like that in uh, half a century at least. Um, they are discriminated. Now this state of exception is not anarchy, it is sanctioned by the law. It is living outside the law by the law. And uh, what happens... <coughs> In Israel, I think in the last uh, three or four years, there have been 35 racist laws. And you can look at the findings of the Russell Tribunal on the internet and you'll see them all. Uh, for example, these two, the law of land leasing and the law of citizenship, I don't know if you know about it, but there is a law in Israel that allows the Jewish National Fund, which is responsible for all land, not to lease land to Arabs. Okay? Which means they cannot, they can never get any land. And the law of citizenship, between, between, which means that if an Arab citizen marries a Palestinian from the territories, they cannot live together. There are a lot of problems about it. So this is the kind of laws that, that you can have uh, in such a situation. The other thing is that all Palestinians in the occupied territories are subjugated to military law. Everything they do is is uh, brought to military law, and that's why you have children imprisoned in military um, prisons, like this girl, for example, who was suspected of having a stone in her hand. She was imprisoned for 45 days without seeing her parents or anybody, just because somebody, a soldier, said she had a stone in her hand. Now, her parents cannot go to the Supreme Court or to anybody to plead. Okay. Uh, how do Israeli school books present this uh, situation of state of exception? They present it as normative. The discrimination of Palestinian citizens and the total lack of social human rights 
of Palestinian non-citizens, those in the territories, are presented as a lot, their fault, and a necessity for our security. For example, uh, this is another civic first book. The Arab population is defined as native minority. They have been transformed into a minority following their painful defeat in the War of Independence, and what ex that explains their difficulty in accepting their minority status. Also, Zionist ideals and Israel's definition as the state of the Jewish people makes it hard for Israel's Arabs to accept their minority status. So this is it. Okay. Now, the name uh, Israel's Arabs. Of course, it's a very demeaning name, yeah? the Arabs of the Israelis. And they are called in many names. You can find in one paragraph Israel's Arabs, uh, the non Jewish population, the non Jewish sector, okay? or Arab Israelis. Uh, no, yeah, Arab Israelis, this is the uh, but never Palestinians. Uh, the word Palestinians, the, the, the qualifier Palestinian, is always coupled with terror, but not with the people. And this, of course, serves the, the idea that Palestinians belong to the great Arab nation and they can go anywhere they want. They have 22 states to go to. A, another quote, the Palestinian attempt to make Israel the sole responsible for the results of the war lacks any moral basis. When you go to war, you cannot lament your defeat. So it's their fault. The Arabs brought it upon themselves for they fought the Jews to perdition. Okay, such phrases. Um, now, this is another thing, I don't know if you know, but all privileges in Israel are given to army veterans. One of these privileges is uh, university dorms. So when the Arab students come, there is no more uh, room in the dorms. And this is a huge problem for them because, especially the girls, uh, are not allowed by the families to, to, to rent the rooms anywhere. <laughs> the families want them to, to, to live in the dorm and they never get the dorm. Uh, so, uh, University of Haifa, um, there, was, uh, there was a complaint to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided that it is not right to give this privilege only to army veterans. So, the government made a law. Okay, every time the Supreme Court doesn't do what they want, they, they make a law. And then how this is presented in the book. The Arab Students Association helped Arab students in petty daily problems such as housing, scholarships, loans and employment. But of course this is a huge problem, not petty problems, because they never have any housing, scholarships, loans or employment. Okay? Naturalization. Part of the Bedouin population dwells in 45 settlements unrecognized by the authorities. Therefore, they do not receive regular services such as municipal budget, water, electricity, and so on and so forth. What can we do? Now, this uh, definition of villages or of people as unrecognized is very weird, but that's the way it is, and it's not 45 villages, of course, it's 180. But it is presented in the books as, as, as a fact of nature. That's the way they are. They are unrecognized. So what can we do? We cannot give them electricity if they are unrecognized. This is a picture, but this is not in the books, of course, of unrecognized village that keeps being destroyed by, by, by uh, the authorities all the time. How do the book does justify the racist law of citizenship? For example, the law denies citizenship for Palestinians who live in the Judea and Samaria or Gaza and who marry Israeli citizens. Yeah, here they say Palestinians. Some defend the law in the name of Israel's defensive democracy and Israel's right to eliminate the danger of terror attacks. Okay, but to bring more Palestinians in. Some comment, commend the law for national reasons and the need to prevent Palestinian immigration and keep the Jewish character of the state. This is the principle of the majority. The Supreme Court ruled that this law is unconstitutional, but rejected the petition against it because it was an emergency law. Now, since we don't have a constitution, all the laws in Israel are emergency laws. Okay? Maybe that's why we don't have a constitution. Another thing, what is the advantage of the military government under which Palestinian citizens and non-citizens have been living forever? 
the military government helped Jewish settlement all over the country and prevented Arab seizure of vacant lands. Now, of course, vacant lands are the lands that were confiscated from them. Okay, but you see the phrasing. Uh, this is a, uh, the only uh, picture I found about the checkpoint. Okay? Now, it's interesting because if you look at this checkpoint, it is called in Hebrew the flying checkpoint. One day it is there, one day it is not there. It's not like this huge construction. And what it tells the, the, the students is that doing checkpoint is not such a big deal. It's not dangerous or anything. You see, it's always empty. The, the soldiers are drinking coffee and checking. And it's nice to do checkpoints, okay? And uh, the whole page is very light and jolly. You have this uh, here, the, the students were very happy to live in a defensive democracy. You have the owl that explains administrative detention. And the funny thing is that here you have the story of Mordecai and Nuno. And I don't know why, maybe you do. And you have this monkey like Van Nuno pressing the wrong button. But altogether, living in our defensive democracy is rather lovely. And the questions are what is the purpose of the checkpoint? How does it serve the disaffected democracy? And so on and so forth. One advantage is disadvantage of administrative detention. The only, uh, the only example they give of an administrative detention is one that a rabbi of a group of radical Orthodox Jews who used to throw stones at, uh, at uh, cars on the Sabbath in Jerusalem. Uh, he, was, uh, he was detained about 40 years ago. And this is the only, the only example they have in the books of administrative detention, so they don't really know what it is, of course. Nobody sees that at the checkpoint. You see the checkpoint they show them is empty. Nobody sees that, and of course nobody sees that. Okay. So it's all very general, very abstract, and very lovely. I mean, that's the way they accept it. Um, when we look at the visuals, we see uh, also the, the inculcation of the Zionist narrative. For example, here, um, it is called Land of Israel Times, and you see here this axe is the Jewish axe, and this axe is the Arab axe. Now, if you talk about the types of the land, you wouldn't talk about people who came three years ago, right? You wouldn't talk about the indigenous. But here they say they came only three years ago, but already they have indigenized themselves. See? And this one really looks like an Arab. And this, this was the idea of social Zionism, to become a Jew with muscles, okay? and to be suntanned and so on and so forth. So this is the ideal. And in all the books that exist in Israel, and I told you there are hundreds of them, you wouldn't find one photograph of an Arab human being like us. Never. Uh, so here, this is a good example because this talks about the Arabs, these two windows, but you don't see any pictures here. It's a, it's a, it's a speech by a, uh, Zionist uh, leader who was born in Palestine, and he said that if Zionist movement does not take into account the true masters of the land, it will not survive. And he called it a missing question. And here is the answer. They show you how much the increase of population of Jews and Arabs, and here they say by 48 the land will be emptied by most of its Arabs. So this is the answer to the question, okay? But you don't see any people. Uh, this is my reading, okay? It's a very colonialist way of, of treating uh, the people and yourself. But there's another um, person who studies the school books in the Truman Institute for Peace at the university, and this is what she says. She's very happy with it. So if you come from an Zionist ideology, it looks, it looks wonderful, all right? This is another um, example of, of manipulating uh, visuals and layout because the, the title of the chapter is Palestinians from refugees to a nation, but of course this is what we see first, right? 
This is the thing that you see first when you, when you open the, the book, and this is, what is it? Jews. Huh? Jews in a, having been attacked. Right, right. This is the first, what was called terrorist attack, which is not very sure it is a terrorist. It was a terrorist attack. It's Haq Rabin says he doesn't negotiate with terrorists. They took over a school in Malot, and he sent the soldiers there, and people, the children were killed, but nobody knows who killed them, really. And this is a soldier who found his sister in the, in the school. So after you see that, okay, and you get the idea, whenever the word Palestinian is mentioned, you must show terror, okay? If you, read, you see that, and then you read the title, you say, what do I care if they are refugees or a nation? I know what they are. Right? So this is a manipulation of, of, of layout and uh, things like that. Uh, let's look a little bit about racist discourse. There are some strategies to show people as others in a racist way. Well, first of all, exclusion, not to show them at all. As I told you, there's not one picture, including books that are called The Arabs in Israel or things like that. You don't have any pictures of them. Uh, or describing them as something subservient, deviant, criminal, or evil. Showing them always, always as types, and not as individuals, homogeneous groups with negative cultural connotation and racial stereotypes. So the Palestinians are always represented, uh, represented as the problems they constitute for Israel, the refugee problem, Asiatic backwardness, demographic problem, and security threat. For example, this is a geography book. The Arab society is traditional and objects to changes by its nature, reluctant to adopt novelties. Modernizations seem dangerous to them. They are unwilling to give anything up for the general good, which means they are unwilling to give more land, of course. So it, this is racist discourse. It's in their blood. That's where they are. You can tell it. Okay. In the Jewish sector, there is no objection to allocate some of the private lands for public building. In the Arab sector, there is an expectation that all public services and needs be provided from the land reservoir of the state. And of course, the land reservoir of the state is their lands. The land that were confiscated. Uh, ever since the state of Israel was founded. Very few next to zero permits were given to build anything in any Arab municipality or to any Arab individual. So whatever they build is illegal, because they have to build. And this is what the children learn. Most of illegal Arab houses are built on municipal land and agricultural land that belongs by the Israeli law to the state. Illegal building is also a result of wishing to evade payment. So there are outlaws there. And of course, the Palestinian Authority steals water from Israel and Ramallah, they're thieves. They are inferior. If they are uh, ever talked about, it's like uh, foreign labor, as if they came from China or Thailand or all this slave market that is going on in Israel. All right? You can read that. But it's characteristic of all developed countries, so we are in good company. Uh, also, everybody else is Arab. Okay? It doesn't matter who they are. Because you have the Jewish population and the non-Jewish. And the non-Jewish, we really don't care who they are. So everybody is Arab, even if they are not. Uh, another way of using racist discourse is by impersonalization, representing people as a problem, the Jewish problem, okay, of Europe and the Palestinian problem now. Uh, so if I, suddenly uh, you have something like that, the Palestinian problem matured in the poverty, the inaction, and the frustration that were the lot of the refugees in the political camps. And this is the Palestinian problem, you see? It looks like an environmental problem ecological problem. It could be any, anything, it could be any poor neighborhood, but no people, of course. And this problem is poisonous. The Palestinian problem would poison for more than a generation the relationship of Israel with an international community. Uh, this same book, written by uh, Professor Eli Barnavi, maybe you know him, 
He's the head of the European Museum now in Vienna. He was the ambassador of Israel in Paris. And uh, this is what he said in his book. Annexing the West Bank would turn Israel into a binational state with an Arab majority, an absurd situation where the Jewish people would become a minority in its own land, and the Zionist dream would turn into a South African nightmare. Now, this was written after the victory of Mandela, of course, and it's quite ridiculous. Uh, yeah. How do you not show people? Okay, this is in racist discourse, in visual racist discourse, you either show them, as I said, as ridiculous and vile and horrible, or you don't show them at all. So this is one way of not showing them. This is the last page in the chapter called Refugees are Running for Their Lives. And you have a lot of places where there are refugees. You show the people, you tell the stories, and you, saw, you show a map of their escape. And then suddenly you have this. No map, no people, no story. All right? A, a Dutch scholar, Van Leuven, who is, by the way, now in Odense University, wrote that about Dutch schools, the way they show the third world, but it's very good for Israel as well, right? To show from so high above that you are not the pilot who flies too high to be able to see the people on whom is dropping the bomb. Okay, and he said this is the objective look of education. You don't see the people. What is written, the, the caption by this picture says the population in the refugee camps is growing fast, the conditions of lives are very hard, the rate of unemployment is high, houses are crowded, poor, and so on and so forth, and the standard of education and hygiene is low. Again, it's existentialization. This is the way it is. Why is it like that? Why are they so poor? Why is it happening? Nobody tells you. And besides, this is not true because the level of education is very high. They don't show that, okay? They show it too high for you to see these things, of course. Or this. This is another way of showing terrorist children, refugees, and you see the refugees go from nowhere to nowhere. So they become a problem, they become an international universal problem. Or to show them as what is called the Oxfam image, yeah? The poor neighbor who lives of our mercy. There's nothing Arab about this uh, farmer, but he is defined here as the non-Jewish population. This is what it means to be non-Jewish. Um, and this is another one. This book, the Geography of the Land of Israel, whenever they mention Arabs, they show this, I don't know what, <laughs> Alibaba type from some 19th century drawing of a European uh, I don't know, graphic design, I don't know, because nobody looks like that. Ever. Right? This is a wife. Okay. This is interesting because this is a map of geographical spread of Arab settlements in Israel. As you see, in the area of Palestine, there is nobody. It's empty. And the Arabs themselves are put in Jordan. You see? Now, it wouldn't have been so uh, poignant if on the other side of the page we wouldn't have this. Since it is empty, you see the Jewish newcomers marching straight into the West Bank. Right? Uh, this is uh, interesting because it's a, it's a diagram of, of, um, of something, of uh, ages in Israel, and here you see it says Jews and others, and here they say Arabs. But since the Arabs are called non-Jews, so who are the others? Nobody tells the children who are the others, but I looked at the registry and the others are the Russians who came and they are not Jewish. But they are not Arabs, so they deserve to be in our group. Okay? And again, you see the, the types. This is another one that was, uh, it was accepted by the Human Developmental Report when Israel managed to put itself, last one, in, a, in the list of, uh, of uh, progressive or developed countries thanks to an asterisk that says Israeli data refers only to Jewish population, and it was accepted. 
Uh, cartography is very, very uh, uh, interesting in terms of exclusion. Um, we know that all maps are lying, yes? But in Israel, they lie in a special way. Because, as I told you, people, children learn about the land of Israel and not the state of Israel. The state of Israel has no meaning in Israel. It's just, you know, a temporary thing. So, all the maps, for example, this is a map of Israel and its neighbors, you see? Or, um, this, for example, another map of population, Arab population. So you see the West Bank is empty. And here, where the, you have population, no Arab city is mentioned, not even Nazareth. Okay, as if they don't exist. And what they say about this in the legend, they say an area for which there are no data. Maybe there are people there, maybe there aren't, we don't know. Okay. A map of Jerusalem that shows you government, cultural, administration, and national sites. If you see here, East Jerusalem is devoid of any cultural, administration, or national sites. You see, it's empty. It doesn't have anything. So really, no, nobody, nobody uh, uh, <coughs> want to resign to the international borders, and that, I think, it explains a lot about the way Israel treats all international decisions. Okay, they are inapplicable for us. That's the point. And children are educated to see these decisions and laws as inapplicable to them. Mental maps. As, uh, I don't know if you know, Baudrillard said, we don't have territories anymore, we just have maps. Okay, it's, the map does not represent the territory, this is, what, this is it, this is what we know. So here, for example, the Arab villages are far from the center. The roads to them are difficult, they have remained out of the progress of change and development, they are hardly exposed to modern life, and there are difficulties to connect them to the electricity and water. Now, you would think we speak about Australia, but we really speak about that, the narrow waistline of Israel, and all these very remote villages are here and here, which is at its widest 50 kilometers or 40 kilometers. So where exactly are these villages that remained out of the process of modernization? But again, nobody asks. Another way is to legitimate occupation by inserting biblical phrases into geography books, okay? This chapter is called One Sea with Many Names, but instead of giving the names of the, of the sea, we have phrases that reiterate the divine promise to Abraham to give him the whole country from Iraq to Saudi Arabia or something. And they explain it. Um, <clears throat> so everything really is recruited to inculcate this narrative, okay? Not only textbooks, history, geography, cartography, archaeology, everything is geared to make the people believe that this is it. The last thing I want to talk about is the strategies of justification and legitimation of massacres. Some books mention some massacres that are still debated in Israel. Most massacres were according to plan, so there's nothing to talk about. But some of them are still debated. And they have to be legitimated and justified for the same thing that I said before. You have to create this usable past for the future generations. Three of them are the Sin Massacre in 48, Kibya Massacre by Ariel John in 53, and the Kafkasa massacre, when people were slaughtered for not being uh, home by the time of curfew, but the curfew was advanced and they didn't know about it. So it was, it was a trick. The trick was that on the, on the eve of, of the Sinai campaign in 56, Israel wanted everybody to think they are going to attack Jordan. And the idea was to advance the curfew, not to tell the people when they come from the, from the fields to kill them, or kill some of them, and then the others will run away to Jordan and will close the border. 
but it didn't happen because they didn't run away. Only 49 women and children who came from the fields were slaughtered by one unit. Most units did not obey this order. Only one. So this is very much debated in Israel, okay? They were put in jail, they were sent to 17 years in jail. Of course, they never spent any time in jail, but don't worry. But uh, this is what they tell them. In, and during the last, um, in 2009 raid on Gaza, the Minister of Education uh, ordered all the teachers to, sh to teach this massacre at schools in order for the children to know how moral we are. Because there was this uh, trial and, uh, and, uh, and the judge uh, uh, defined this slaughter as an um, uh, no, um, unlawful order, what? okay? Uh, and this is a term that was coined in Nuremberg to describe the Nazis' actions. And this is considered in Israel the highest, the highest point in Israeli Supreme Court uh, history. When he said that uh, it, was, it, was, it was such a deal. So how do, you, how do you really legitimate massacres? First of all, the victims are presented as objects, okay? And they are dealt with in a rational and utilitarian calculus. For example, between 100 and 240 corpses were found. More than 40 were killed, a few dozens were killed. Like you talk about animals, you know, it's just numbers you never talk. And there is an instruction in Israel to, I know it is to journalists, you should never call Palestinians victims. So, for example, uh, one way is what we call mythopoesis. It's like mythological stories that Oedipus killed his father, but he saved the city. So, yes, it was horrible to kill these people, but in the long run, it was good for the Jews. So, for example, in Dir Yassin, the slaughter of friendly Palestinians brought about the flight of other Palestinians, which enabled the establishment of a coherent Jewish state. All books like that. The Kibia massacre. You know, when Ariel Sharon formed a special unit to go into Jordan and kill Palestinians there so they will not infiltrate to Israel. Slaughter of Palestinians in their homes brought about some confidence, and all the books speak about some confidence to Jews in their homes, and restored the morale and dignity of the army. Okay? What they did is just kill the whole village. And again, I quote Member because he says, one horror at the sight of death that into satisfaction when it is someone else who is dead. Okay, so it works on this psychology. Kafir uh, Kassem, there are two things. One, a barbaric crime brought about an enlightened verdict. Okay, the duty to disobey manifestly unlawful orders. Okay, of course you can never know. It's manifestly or not manifestly. And the other thing, the slaughter enabled by the military government and its permanent situation of curfew was the starting point of a, of a process that ended 10 years later with the abolition of this same military government. So it was good for them too, to be slaughtered, okay? Because it only took another 12 years and, and, uh, and they were free. For example, I give you some quotes. The escape of the Arabs, enhanced by the massacre of Dir Yassin, solved a terrifying demographic problem, and even a moderate person such as the first president, Weizmann, spoke about it as a miracle. So after telling you that, you know, they were killed and too bad that they were killed, the chapter ends with that. All right? Or this, for example, 50 Egyptians were killed, 40 were taken prisoners, the greatest operation since the War of Independence. In what way can such a headline influence the morale of Israeli citizens? See, it's leading them to say it does. And so on. Do you think the reprisals were enough to deter the Arabs from acting against Israel? Right. Uh, sometimes they use explanations which are very similar to what we heard in Gaza as well. For example, the loudspeaker encouraging the inhabitants of Tyria Sin to leave their village did not work. The people did not leave the village. And that is the reason why the number of casualties among them was so too bad. We told them to leave, you know, in Gaza it was the same thing. We told them to leave. They didn't. What can we do? Or the soldiers did not know that people were hiding in their homes that night. 
They cannot know everything. <laughs> All right? And what we call appraisal, social esteem and appreciation of the killers. After the report about the massacre of Kibia, we see that the 101 unit excelled in their audacity. The soldiers were endowed with extraordinary courage, improvisation, perseverance in the hardest condition, tenacity, and loyalty to wounded friends, and became the myth of the combatant soldier in the IDF. So such wonderful people could not have done an unjustified wrong. You see? And, of course, uh, you have the mythization of killers, yeah? Like that, you see, these are, this is after Deir Yassin. This is not Deir Yassin, this is another village that was according to plan. It was cleansed according to plan. And you see our beautiful, erect, brave soldiers on the rubble, you see? Here, if we go with his hand, he points here to the road to Jerusalem, which was liberated. And here you have a ditty song or poem that, that really glorifies this uh, these soldiers, and this is how you create the myth. Or this, after Kibia, you have Amir Shamon here, and Chief of Staff Moshe Dayan, you have Rafael Eitan. All these people rose to very high positions in the Israeli uh, government. So such role models, such wonderful people, such upstanding citizens could not have done, have done an unjustified wrong. So whenever they do any wrong, it must be justified. This is the idea. And again, the song. You cannot have it without the song. <coughs> or a poster. This poster says growth versus siege. You see the Arab lurking here waiting for the, for the boats and planes that bring Jewish uh, refugees. And this is the answer. Okay, this is so what is the claim of this report? Positive outcome for us may condone or overlook evil done to them. Okay, they don't say it's good to kill people. But so much pain inflicted on them is tolerable if it prevents as much greater pain for us. And empathy is very religion and ethnicity related, of course. So students in Israel learn to legitimize massacres by transcending the individual incident and considering the long-term consequences from a Zionist military point of view to use the language and arguments of politicians and generals. And we could see it in Gaza in, in the testimonies of soldiers and so on. And this produces what is called a literacism, which is racism that comes from above. And then it's implemented and enacted in other social fields, of course. Um, and you can do it only if you go through a process of racialization of the occupied, okay? And make them look inferior, evil, Philistines, okay, bloodthirsty, world monitoring, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'll finish with that. This is what Zizek says, and it's very nice. He says, cynicism is, they know what they're doing, but still they're doing it. So all these things are very sophisticated, well-planned, and successful, I must say. Okay, because when you see the soldiers, Israeli soldiers, who, apart from that, receive a very humanistic, liberal, uh, good education, it can explain a little bit what happens to them once they put on a uniform and meet the enemy. Okay, but it's a very hard work. They start from the age of three uh, to do that, and by the time they're 18, they're already to be very, very good soldiers. Okay, thank you. We finished this part. Thank you so much, Nurit, for a very insightful and uh, impressively informative talk. Thank you so much. Um, and um, I will actually just leave it, um, I will open it up for you if you guys have any questions. And just raise your hand and you'll... Uh, do you like one, one or two questions at a time or...? No, I have a question I'll answer. All right. Perfect. So if there are any questions, please just raise your hand. And when I pick you out, stand up and say your name. The gentleman on the seventh floor. Yeah. Yeah, you, Tor. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I was wondering, I was very young when the South Africa, the apartheid regime broke down. Well, very young. Very young. Um, but I believe the school books in South Africa during the apartheid time was uh, similar to these, you know, dehumanizing the black youth in South Africa. And we all know how the world ended up reacting. 
united world against apartheid in South Africa and the united Western world uh, for apartheid in Israel. Okay. Thank you. You hear me? Uh, I think two things. I mean, the main thing is profit, really. Uh, the world profits from the occupation of Palestine. I'll do it here? Okay. Uh, the whole world profits from the occupation of Palestine, and uh, during the Russian tribunal, which uh, lasted five years, we had uh, uh, staggering evidence that every single country in Europe profits from the occupation in one way or another. So it's a question of money, first of all. And then I think the excuse, and I'm saying the excuse, which is quite lame, really not to interfere and not to, uh, to make Israel stop and change uh, its ways, is the Holocaust. Because Israel uh, succeeded in turning every criticism against Israel into anti-Semitism, and Europeans and Americans don't want to be called anti-Semitism, and it is a lame excuse. Because, you know, when children are dying, you shouldn't care about the names you're called. And uh, I don't know of anybody who died because he was called anti-Semite, or of anybody who died because he was anti-Semitic. But a lot of people die because they're called Palestinians. So this is a lame excuse, but it is used amply by the West in order to excuse their behavior, which is really, I think, it's, it's, it, uh, it's economic and nothing else. They really profit, everybody profits from that. Everybody. Tina. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you see a, a shift in uh, the vocabulary or how people speak about it? During last summer's assault on um, Gaza, it seems like, especially in the US, a lot of people were kind of being forced to take a position on what's going on, especially in, in the Jewish circles in the US. But, but do you see, I don't know if it hits anywhere in Israel, but, but do you see in the surrounding world a, a shift of, of paradigms and, and um, trusting the, the well-known narrative, or is it just the same thing? No, I think there is a shift. There's a lot more a resistance, and I know that in America a lot more student organizations and pro Palestinians and so on and so forth. I think also the word apartheid now is is related to Israel everywhere, and it wasn't like that before. And the word racist and so on, but it's too slow. You see what I mean? It's too slow, and it doesn't. It will affect maybe eventually. Uh, the, and said, but uh, it will affect things. But uh, for now, I mean, with more than a million a day that Israel is receiving from the United States, it could tell us. But there is a lot, even in Israel, there are a lot of organizations, uh, not not official, I mean, there's not a party, a political party for that, but a lot of organizations that are uh, uh, Palestinian and Israelis against the occupation, and they're very vocal. Yes, of course, there is a shift in public opinion, a huge shift, but again, it doesn't affect the, 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 the politics. It's very hard. Yeah. In the eighth row, over there. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Aisha, and I was wondering um, is there any organizations or movements who try to rewrite history within the Israeli slash Jewish community? Because this, I mean, this review just gave us. This very poisonous nutrition of, of school children just makes it, I mean, they just reproduce hatred. And I was wondering whether you have seen on how does uh, children or high, I don't know, high school um, pupils, because now we have social media, and how do they respond to what they're taught? Because, I mean, today you can expose everything. I mean, so. Look, in order to publish a book, you have to be authorized. So even people who are leftist, when they write books, they have to comply, they have to compromise. And uh, it's, it's a business. Uh, the teachers take it as it is, because they believe in it, they were educated the same way. 
And children don't really care in England, and children have other business <laughs> than to go verify their books <laughs> after they have put in the books. But the books are very influential because even if you don't want to, 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 to read them, you have to put the examination. So these are the only things they read. And this is why it's so important to speak about it. And no, there are no organizations that try. The, the, there were two attempts still going on of writing a joint book. I mean, both narrative, not a joint narrative, but a book where you have both narratives on, on special issues. But the Ministry of Education doesn't allow it to be uh, to be taught in uh, schools. I know that, that this one of these books, one of these series of books. Uh, is taught uh, in many other countries, in France, in Italy, in Macedonia, um, uh, I mean, israeli palestinian conflict, uh, this book where you have the two narratives, but in Israel you have no chance to, to do that. And again, teacher were, teachers were educated the same way, and this is what they know. Uh, for example, in my course, when they studied they, they they really opened their eyes for the first time to see what, what it really means, what it really says. And after that, you know, when you know something, you cannot unknow it. But I don't know what they do with it in class. It's very hard. It's very hard. Yeah. I see uh, five fingers now, so I'll begin in the, in the very back. You in the white t-shirt? Yeah. Yes. Could you please um, stand up because uh, I have a fear that not everyone in the audience can hear what's being asked. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, why do academics, even pro-Palestinians, and even Patsan and Hamas, like, only refer to the 67 borders? Why do, why do nobody refer to the 48 borders? <laughs> like, it's... Uh, well, that's the way it is. ...difference. And then my second question is, what's the status? Do you know of uh, the area of Silwan? The what? You know, the area of Silwan? Where um, they're supposed to say that King David's city yeah. is was there and yeah. it's, pro, it's mostly Palestinians who live there. No, well, it's good for some years, yes. Uh, why do people refer to 67 borders? I think that uh, even most Palestinian leaders refer to 67 borders, this is a political thing. Um, but most academics in Israel just don't say anything. What about pro Palestinians? Pro Palestinian, yeah, well, it depends who you are. I mean, there's the Zionist left and the left. Left. Most people do refer to, I think, 67 borders because this is what the Palestinians say. You see? Some of them don't, of course, but the majority does. And, uh, and that's it. I have no other, I have no other, uh, no other opinion about it. But of course, it, if there is peace, yeah, and if there is, I don't know. some kind of federation or whatever, it won't really matter because if you live in peace, so you don't really care. Uh, what Palestinians say mostly is uh, get out of our throats and then we'll talk about borders. Okay? First of all, let us live and get out of there. Of where everybody agrees you shouldn't be. And then, then we go on. Uh, that's what I hear. Uh, the other question was? Ah, so one. Yeah, Silwan is uh, slowly but surely evicted. Uh, people are, are driven out of their homes. Uh, there are, you know, excavations under homes because uh, I don't think King David lived there. I think they say it was the garden of the temple. But there's still no evidence. Huh? There's still no evidence. You really want evidence? No, no, no. Of course there's no. Even to the Trojan War, there's no evidence. So what? Uh, you know, we live by stories and myths much more than by facts. Much more. Um, but I think the, the, the most terrible thing about Silwan is that uh, for the last year, uh, at least very, very harshly, there have been uh, a war against children there. And every night, soldiers burst into houses, kidnap children, age of four, five, six, and throw them to jail for, for days and weeks and months sometimes without seeing their parents and without knowing where they are. And the last two months, they changed the tactic and they started to shoot them in the eye. I don't know if you know, but only last week, I think, we had uh, on Thursday another child that was shot in the eye 
So the war has tend to be a war against children in, uh, in this area, which is... And all this in order to push the parents to leave. Yeah. For all of Jerusalem. I can repeat it if you... Okay. Yes. Uh, and I acknowledge uh, the role of boycotting apartheid in South Africa, and I believe in boycotting for principal reasons, but I don't believe that it's an effective tool uh, in regards to the Palestine and country, because for the average person, it's difficult to boycott Israel. It's the economic of Israel is too huge, I believe. It's too what? It's too, it's too strong. You can't even support UNICEF without your money going. Yeah. Country. Um, so I think that some of us hope uh, that the uh, or think that the only solution is an uprise within Israel. And so my question to you is: Do you believe that upcoming Israel generations will acknowledge the injustice, injustice happening in the name of their country? No. Um, taking into consideration <coughs> brainwashing. Okay. Uh, listen, the situation in Israel is not that bright. Huh? Um, 43 or 45%, 35% of Israeli Jewish population is under poverty line today. And these are people who work and have salaries. It's never been like that. I mean, you can imagine a third of the children go still hungry. It's been like that for, for a number of years now, so it's not so bright. Uh, there are a number of, of very rich people, but you know, I don't know if you know, but in the OCD uh, tests that they do all the time, we are first in gaps between the richest and the poorest. Mm -hmm. So if there is an uprising, it will be for this reason, because uh, there are a lot of groups inside Israel that suffer terribly from, from when they don't know this is the reason, or they deny that this is the reason, but uh, social injustice in Israel, in the Jewish population, is horrible, like uh, against the Ethiopians, against the Arab Jews, four generations already, and so on and so forth. So if there is a pride, it would be on economic reasons and social reasons without considering the, the occupation. I mean, this is like the last thing they think about. Um, I think boycott is very good because, first of all, it's, 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 a, it's a very civil civilized way to, to express uh, resistance. It's not violent, and uh, it's legal, I mean, and it's good. And if you consider the law that we just had for, I think, a month, there is a law against people like me, for example, who advocate. That means they are so afraid of that. It affects them horribly. They really are afraid. So it's a success to the BDS, you think. Uh, if the government is so much afraid, then, then it means that this is the right direction to go. No other direction to go. And of course, the education, but as you see, it's very hard. And now it's getting harder because the government becomes more and more fascist. And uh, I believe uh, books will come out today. Even the last years, ever since I finished my book, the last two, three uh, years, uh, books that come out don't mention the Palestinians in any way. In any way. They are just not there. They don't exist. <coughs> Instead of talking about Gaza, about refugees in Gaza, they talk about Darfur, and in a chapter called uh, Making Peace or Living in Peace, or I don't know what, they call about, uh, talk about Tibet and Nepal and whatever. Arabs are non-existent. Also, Ethiopian Jews are non-existent because you see this racism doesn't stop with the Palestinians, it goes on. So education uh, becomes more and more uh, indoctrinating, simplified, uh, like a military manifest. So I believe it will be worse before it gets better. Pamela in the fifth room. 
think you kind of answered one of the questions that I had, but maybe you can elaborate on how your research was received in Israel, not only by the government, but also your co-academics. And then um, another question that I have, if, yes, you study these books at school at a very early age, but most of the Israelis, they are, they are like in several places, like Ghana, West Bank, so they see it with their own eyes, they see the checkpoints at the occupation. Does it change anything, or is it that the indoctrination is so strong that it actually doesn't? Uh, okay, so, so, so I know it is there a need to, to what? repeat what was said? Yeah. Okay, she asked about uh, how my research was received <laughs> in Israel, and also how come people in Israel see what's going on and they don't change, right? Uh, the research was not received, let's <laughs> say. It was ignored completely. And uh, the, only, uh, the only result of this was that I am practically banned from all conferences and projects that have to do with textbooks, okay? And this is funny because I'm pretty known in the world and whenever people come to such conferences and they ask where I am, uh, I, have, I have a Palestinian colleague who reports to me all the time, and she said, they said we couldn't afford her, okay? Uh, so I'm completely, I mean, this is it, you passed the line. Um, some don't, I mean, I have a friend who is the head of communication department at Haifa University and she invites me every year to a class. But this is, uh, uh, so it was not received, nobody talks about it, uh, not interesting. Um, indoctrination is very hard. Uh, Richard Dawkins called it mind infection. He says it's like a virus of the mind. It's like a virus of, of, of a computer. It comes into the mind and changes the whole system. And I spent some days now with colleagues whom I appreciate a lot, and they speak the same way. I mean, yes, of course it's too bad, but if we let go, you know what will happen. They will slaughter us. And you said there's no proof. Of course, there's no proof. So it's not the indoctrination. It's really mind infection. It's very hard to approach these things. Very, very hard. And you really have to want to do it. To look uh, differently as things. You know, Israelis don't see Palestinians. They don't know they exist. West Jerusalem never go to East Jerusalem. It's five minutes. They never go there. And if they go there to buy, then they buy and they leave. They don't see the people, but they don't have friends and they don't speak the language. Most Israelis don't speak Arabic. You see, because why should you? We are part of Europe. We are not part of the Middle East. In school, we don't learn anything about the Middle East, except that it's a problem and an enemy. But we learn a lot about Europe and this and that. So the whole system is geared to convince you that they don't exist. They just don't exist. Now that they cannot work in Israel anymore, and they bring all these slaves from all over the world, you don't even see Palestinians. So you forget about them. They're just not there. They're, they're inexistent. And this is a huge success. Huge, huge success. And then you go as a soldier. You go as a soldier, then you go as a soldier. Then you do what you're told, and they tell you they are problems, they are invaders, they are a, a danger. Every small child is a potential terrorist, and so on and so forth. That's, that's the way people speak, and I'm telling you, the best people that think they are left, they are liberals. And this is the way they speak, you see? And everything that, I'll tell you something minor, in the college where I teach, uh, they have a group of teachers from, West Jews, from East Jerusalem, Palestinians, that came for a degree, okay? So, they allocated them some rooms that they rented in East Jerusalem, and they don't study in the college. And now this Palestinian colleague of mine, who is doing the same work I'm doing with Palestinian uh, textbooks, uh, she was sent to teach them there, and she said, it's horrible, I mean, the conditions are horrible, that it's not the condition of the university, you have no computers, you have no library, you have no cafeteria, it's cold, it's dirty. And when she, she complained, they said, well, it's for their own good. They will feel better, you know, she said. And, uh, and that's the way they live, you see, that's the way they live. It's very, very hard, uh, unless there is, I don't know, what catastrophe will not uh, change. But again, if you look, for example, uh, the reports of breaking the silence 
the evidence and testimonies of, of soldiers and lots of soldiers who came out of Gaza and, and confessed and, and told what they were doing. <coughs> so there is some kind of shift, okay? But they do it after they've done what they've done. It's very hard. And they're educated to be small soldiers from a very, very tender age. They don't know how to manifest, they don't know how to organize a rally, for example. You don't have this in Israel at all. And when they do, it's for, you know, the wrong things. They don't connect the terrible economy and social situation of Israel with their education. As if it doesn't exist. It is not there. Okay? Um, Dennis, you want to turn and you ask there's a very interesting mechanism of uh, legitimization that uh, I see is used a lot in Israeli politics and people who defend Israel, where they say um, the the outposts are illegal, as a way of saying the the other the settlements that are not the outposts are not as illegal, and uh, the burning of uh, of a child. Uh, a Palestinian child was terrible as a way of saying uh, the murder in Gaza of uh, 2,000 people was uh, no, not, not that bad, it was more civilized than the um, So my question to you is, how, do, you, do you see textbooks trying to use this mechanism as well uh, as legitimizing by saying something else is worse in Israel and, and, and what, what kind of role does this kind of legitimizing in the, in the politics as well. Well, just as I said, most massacres are legitimated mm. a priori. But those that are not are being legitimated by the far-reaching consequences. Yes, but what happened with, the, with this boy that was burned, you know, it's not the authorities who burned him. That's why it's not good. When it comes from the authority, from the army, then of course there must be a good reason to burn people. But when these uh, three uh, nuns came from uh, then you can say that they are criminals, and this is a very good way of, when a criminal lies them, then we are okay. And you know, uh, they didn't allow the, the family to have, uh, they had a small uh, flower bed near the house. In his memory, it was destroyed by the police. They had, uh, on the house, they put a sign with his name and picture, it was taken off. Uh, it's not that they, uh, you know, embraced them, but then, they uh, gave them social security compensation and they put him on the list of the fallen. And the father asked to take him out and there's a lot of huge uh, thing. So it's not, uh, yeah, as you say, this is a way of, uh, you know, this outpost is illegal means that the others are not. And that's politics, I mean, you see it everywhere. It's not typical Israel, everywhere is there. Yeah, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the rope behind you and then it's you afterwards and then we start from the back again. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. You, could um, you stand up? Okay. Thanks. So, um, um, I, I heard you spoke a little bit about uh, differences during the years. Like, uh, the, the last few years there's a complete uh, ignoring of the Palestinians. And, and I was wondering while I, I watched the presentation because... Uh, I was trying to remember my school books. I'm an Israeli and I finished around high school around the, before Rabin's assassination. Um, and I couldn't remember the, the text as horrible as they seem to me now. And I wonder if it's because I'm, I'm more aware now or is it because they changed? So Because you're more aware now. Yeah. First of all, you know, you're not aware. When you live in this, this course, you, you, it's really very hard, you see? And then, as I said, children or young people are not really interested in all that. They want to take the exam and move on. So there are very few who are really, who really go into it and say, oh, what is it? I don't know if you saw there's a movie, a documentary called This Is My Land. And she filmed uh, two Israeli and two Palestinian classrooms. And it's amazing to see how in Israeli schools, one of them is Neve Shalom, which is a mixed Arab Jewish, the teachers are busy trying not to say anything. You have not to teach. 
and uh, it's very impressive, but that's what they do all the time. When, whenever uh, students ask a real question, they just, uh, they, they, they're busy surviving this, you see, not answering, not really opening anything for discussion. So, students get used to that. But you didn't see a difference in, like uh, around Ramin's assassination because listening to Israeli discourse. Yes. Um, the book that I showed of Barnavi, it's, it's, it's considered really leftist because he's talking about that and he's talking about the, the PLO. But the ideology is the same, you see? The, the, the basic assumptions are the same. That we must have a Jewish majority, that they are a threat, and so on. So it's more or less, it depends on the government. And of course, whenever we have a more right-wing government than the previous one, they, uh, they shred books. I mean, the right-wing governments always shred books that were published in the previous government. If you look at them, so for example, there was one book um, uh, where uh, the curriculum demands that on, on, on uh, sensitive topics you would have an exposition of two uh, opinions. So on the refugee problem or something, they put an Israeli historian, Israeli point of view, and for the Palestinian uh, point of view, they put the Wali Khalid, who was a Palestinian historian, you know. And the Minister of Education just ordered the books off the shelves, without any committee, without anything, from one day to another. And they were shred, all the books, all the copies. Now, since it's a business and it's a huge loss of money, they changed it. By September, you had, under Israeli point of view, the same Israeli uh, historian, and under Palestinian point of view, another Israeli historian, Benny Moise. Okay? And one of the writers was a student of mine, so he, saw, he sent me the PDF of the ancient book, and you can get it. And also the letter they got. And in the letter, the, the inspector says, our students are not mature enough to know truth from lie. <laughs> you see? So, uh, but you as a student or as someone from outside, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it. We do this we end here at 6 o'clock, but I'm guessing if those who have a question, if you raise your mm -hmm. hand, I'll count them up to see if we'll make them. One with you will definitely take, but... <laughs> so now there's... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You think you can take seven more questions? No, I don't. All right. So, no more than those seven. I'm keeping, I'm counting. You there, please. Mm -hmm. I wonder, with this uh, Israeli government going on more to the right, more fascistic, as you say, how people like you uh, even can survive? I mean, will, apparently, you live in Jerusalem, or you're teaching Jerusalem, and you're still there. I just wonder how long time before you will fly to save yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, because you I give me a job at this university <laughs> uh, against uh, Jews, no? Um, and the other thing is, uh, do you think uh, the rest of is Israel so geopolitically important? that the world leaders, I mean not us, the people who try to do a little thing, uh, would accept really to make a change in the relation to make two states or whatever they, but a solution. Uh, okay, and the second one, I don't know about that. <laughs> I think that as long, as long as they profit from it, nothing will happen. It's all a question of money. What do they care? But um, and really, people, I mean, started not to care. They are tired of all this. Um, as for survival, I think I don't know really. People are afraid. They're afraid. Yeah, there are a lot of professors who erase their Facebooks and who sign in uh, pseudonyms and things like that. People are really physically even afraid because now when you go on a rally. 
you, you, you're physically unsafe because the police will go with the thugs of the, of the other side and they will crush you and so on. But then I think you have to make a decision, okay? And you have to make a decision who you are and how you want to live and how, I don't know, in my case, how I want my children to, to see me, okay? And uh, I don't think there's way back once you realize and once you are aware of things, there's no way back. Um, but I know a lot of people who are very, very much afraid, very afraid. And even uh, people who signed all kinds of petitions and then asked their signature to be taken off. Uh, and people who are the most leftist radicals in Israel. So you have this, yeah. People aren't very much afraid to be caught and uh, to be interrogated. And I don't know if it becomes worse and worse and worse uh, than it will uh, eventually. <laughs> but it was I know that my Arab colleagues are very much afraid and they don't even dare. They they hardly dare to go to the supermarket today and speak Arabic on the phone. So that's much worse. Much a fellow from Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I was wondering how, uh, how, I, how, it was like how you were received by the American, uh, American University. And is there any uh, attempt at modeling his voice as I've like, always read any books for the presentation of the American University? Uh, American University? Uh, yeah, there. <laughs> But not only American, you know. Uh, yes, American universities are much harsher than, I mean, we have much more freedom of speech than any American. And you know that. In America, you cannot say a word against Israel. Yeah. Not me, but people who work there, they cannot say anything. Um, but um, again, I think it's, it's a question of, of who and what. I was invited to, to New York in February, and uh, to a conference about linguistics, but I presented a linguistic um, and semiotic analysis of the legitimation of massacres. This is what I did. And then they asked me to, to do a public uh, lecture in NYU. And uh, there were a lot of people who came, but after that, uh, the professor who uh, organized the linguistics uh, uh, conference told me they had a hard moment. And then they decided that they must judge the work by its academic uh, worth. They did ask me to change the title. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's there all the time. Yeah, sure. But of course, it depends where and what and who you are, and, uh, etc. But I know that in America, it's much worse than in Israel for the Jews. Yeah. Well, are, you in, uh, are you on any of those lists of, like, uh, you know, for magicians, campus porch, where they keep, you know, these? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, my son said it's, it's wonderful because if you want to know who wrote what, you to go to those lists and you have it all. <laughs> yes, but there was once, there is this organization in Israel called Intil 2, which uh, uh, took upon itself, I mean, it's a governmental thing, but they say they're independent, uh, to purify the universities from leftists. Uh, and they burst into my class once, and they, they distribute leaflets to the students with quotes things that I say. The students were pretty indifferent. And they brought television, some kind of television with them, but uh, it's, not that, it's not that bad yet. The girl in the back? So, uh, do you the segregated education system? Excuse me? Uh, because of the segregated education system, how is this narrative presented in the Palestinian schools within Israel, the mixed schools, and within the settlements? Settlements don't have Palestinians. Right. Yeah. In Israel, for the Israeli citizens, it's the same books translated to Arabic. Uh, Arab, uh, Arab Israeli students don't learn anything about their history, their culture, their literature, their poetry, nothing. They don't know until they come to university. Okay? They, they learn the same narrative and the same materials. The same. Everything is the same. Translated to Arabic. In the Palestinian uh, authority, 
they have another system of education. Then they have different books. You will have to invite my colleague to, to tell you about that. But in East Jerusalem, East Jerusalem is controlled by both. They, uh, in, in terms of content and books, they take the uh, Palestinian Authority books because they do the, the Jordanian articulation. But uh, the Israeli ministry is in charge of, of all the logistics, the salaries and the, the rooms. You know, there are about 35 children in, in 35,000 children in East Jerusalem that don't go to school because they don't know where to go because the ministry doesn't provide them with classes and so on. But there, there is a censorship of the Israeli ministry. So you see uh, the same book the very same book as it started in Mamala and in Jerusalem. And what happened is in Jerusalem, you would have the title of the chapter and then a blank page. Uh, yes, they take off everything that says Palestine or nationality or, I don't know, many things. So half of the book is just a title and empty uh, blank uh, pages. And I think this is the best education because uh, <laughs> <laughs> they grow up to very, very resistant, but uh, it's very complicated, yeah? it's very complicated for them. Now uh, they want to force them to do the Israeli education, uh, because they don't want them to go to other universities. It's a waste of, it's, uh, it's a lost money. So it's, uh, but usually you have this, uh, this uh, division. And the Spelmans use the same books? Yeah, they use, I mean, you have, such huge amount of books you can choose. Some of them are really, really right wing, and some of them are less. I mean, right wing meaning they don't have sources, they don't have facts, they don't have anything. It's a manifest of how much we kill them more than they killed us, something like that. And uh, for the religious schools, the enemy is not the Palestinians, they are just you know, the evil lurking all over. The enemy are the secular Jews, so the whole the books are geared against secular Jews, how we are going to defeat them. Okay. The third one, Queen, Queen Sharp, yes. Okay. Um, it seems that there's a little distinction between the, so you have people growing up with these uh, textbook and maybe you, you call it a mind infection where they grow to believe these truths and then maybe they grow up to be teachers or to make these decisions based on this truth that they believe. And then on the other hand, you present the kind of cynicism where actually they know that this is uh, wrong, but they need to push the agenda and power and control in this. Do you see um, a difference? Do you, do you see this difference when you talk to people or when, when if there's a truth, if people know that this is somehow in their subconscious, know that this is wrong, and also would knowing this difference also change the approach to how to, how to deal with this? Because it, I don't think people who really believe this is true would be ready for such a presentation because it's so different from their world view. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, those who know are those who write the books. Yeah. You see? Um, and authorize them. So, <laughs> these are the ones who know. Um, yeah, it's not easy. In my course, for example, I, uh, since Israel is such a racist place and discrimination is so horrible towards many other groups. I start with that. So people start telling their own stories. You see? By the time I get to the Palestinians, I have gained their trust already. <laughs> yeah, you have to be a bit uh, political about it. Yeah. But I never had uh, a case of someone just walking out of the class or something like that. No. And I see by the papers that they get it very well. Really, really well. Yeah. But you have to build it, of course, otherwise it's a shock. It's a real shock. You are one of the original askers? Yes, I do. Hi. Um, I was surprised that you mentioned there were the masterpieces were mentioned in books, yeah. some of them. And I was wondering, uh, those massacres that, had, that took place during the Second World War, where the migration of Jews start coming to Palestine, if there is any mention on the on books? No, I don't think you call them massacres. I think it was, uh, there were clashes, okay, between
between Jews and Arabs and a mutual things like in Hebron there was a huge massacre of Jews and uh, in other places there were massacres of uh, Arabs and so on. But, but so yes, are, yes, they, they are mentioned. They're not only in the textbooks, they're also on big placards if you go to the settlements. Right. It no, says, there. If you go to our kids, you can find, it is called massacres, some villages just disappear. And this is during the, the 48 war. No, before 48. The systematic cleansing of Palestine started a bit before, yeah, but not too much before. But it was again, it was it was authorized by the, the Zionist leadership. You see, so it depends. If it was authorized by the Zionist leadership, then it was according to plan. And then in school books, you don't have to legitimate them because they are legitimate. You have to legitimate those that were out of the plan. Like the same was not in the plan, supposedly, and so on. Mm -hmm. right. uh, those that were, for example, Ramla and Lidia and all this, they were according to plan. So there are books coming all the time, documents about how terrible it was, and so on and so forth. But the idea that this place has had to be cleansed what is, is, uh, is accepted already, you see? There are some that are still debated. It's, it's, a, it's a funny kind of difference, but uh, that's the difference. Yeah. Um, the Do something together and say, calm down, they don't care for anything. Mm -hmm. 
for anything. I mean, they're really good soldiers. Most of them, of course, some of them are not. And then a final yeah. question on the third. My, my question was about the same issue. I wonder why the teacher accepted this order from the university. So you said uh, in the lecture that, that uh, it is uh, employing more, people, more and more people in your country. Not enough yet, but more and more people are thinking otherwise. Uh, and uh, I wonder, there must be some teachers between these people. Yes. Why, why don't they try to change? No, they try. Are they, not, are they afraid? Or no, 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 no. They have a lot of freedom. They can, they can even use other sources. You see, they're not obliged to use the book. They're not obliged. They can say that I know teachers who send their children to, to libraries to read, read books. You see, there's no... A teacher in Israel, they have a curriculum. But the curriculum is a kind of suggestion you generally have to do it. Inside the classroom, do a lot of things. But of course, there are parents and this and that. I mean, the state of mind in Israel is very strong right wing. Very. Of everybody. Even those who think they're left. But some teachers do otherwise. Some teachers and some principals, yeah. Some principals, for example, a, a, there is this tradition that every year, especially the last years of high school, uh, officers come to the class and uh, from all units of the army trying to convince them to, to enlist to their units. Uh, and there's at least two uh, principals who don't get them in. And uh, things like that. <coughs> yeah, there are some who are very brave. But listen, you have to make a living and, and salary is so low. So low that most of them have two, three, four jobs. And it doesn't leave you too much time for that. Uh, but those who do, they, 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 they juggle. And uh, they try, yes. They try, and then they leave. They, they find another job. I mean, uh, so what you have are really uh, those mediocre people, uh, mostly women, who take it as a job. Okay? We're not very enthusiastic, not very idealistic, is it? Like most places. Um, I'd like to take the prerogative to ask you a question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm wondering that because in your criticism of um, the textbooks, you go after foundational issues of the national myth, so the need for a, which is you know, the need for a, a Jewish majority, yes. which you might say is a, a condition sine qua non, even for the left wing and for the right wing Zionist narrative. And um, I'm then you know, to compare you know, the, the criticism of your work with, say, the, um, the research that was commissioned by the State Department, which, which the conclusion of it was that, well, both sides are demonizing and dehumanizing each other, but it's not that bad as it's been made out to be. And I'm just wondering, does your foundational criticism of Israel as a Jewish state hit you as a more critical um, analyst of Israeli textbooks than your average um, uh, Israeli um, educational scholar? Oh, if I understand. <laughs> Listen, this study was really commissioned. Okay, you so, say uh, it was commissioned and uh, that's what it was. Uh, it doesn't have, in my opinion, a lot of academic merit. Um, and also, I heard it from, you know, there was a, a, a commission that was to accompany the study and evaluate it. Someone who resigned from the institute was commissioned. And so, but they, what they did, um, they didn't go that far, that, that, that deep. See, what they did, they did content analysis. And they would say, like, okay, so in this and this book, they mentioned the Nakba. So don't tell us we don't recognize the Nakba. But they didn't go as far as to say, what do they say about the Nakba? And how they, so they, they didn't do any rhetoric and they didn't do any semiotic analysis. They didn't consider the visuals at all. They didn't consider the visuals at all. So it was really a commissioned, uh, a commissioned uh, analysis.
analysis, and um, they receive what they want to receive, but there's no comparison between Israeli and Palestinian textbooks for many reasons. First of all, uh, Palestinian textbooks are written under occupation with a lot of censorship because they are financed by World Bank, by the European Parliament. I think it was also by Denmark for some time, I don't know if it's still. And all these organizations are completely uh, dominated by, uh, by Israeli uh, demands. And so they are not allowed to, to like I told you, they are not allowed to write anything about nationality or about resistance. They are not allowed to even mention the refugee uh, problem. They are not allowed to write about the Nakba. Uh, so you cannot compare it to a system that is completely free, not monitored, not censored, not supervised, as is Israeli. Okay? There's no comparison. That's why when you say both sides, it's not true. Because one side is under occupation. And uh, they have terrible problems even of paper and ink okay, to publish these books. So there's no comparison, there's no symmetry whatsoever. But if you read these books, and most of them are translated to English, you can read them on the internet, uh, the business is not to be racist, you know, because when you are subjugated, you don't become racist towards your subjugator. You become racist in order to subjugate. Okay? You don't need to be racist against the usurper. You need to, 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 to get rid of them, to liberate yourself. You use other tools. And not racism. So, I don't know if they want to be racist, but even if they wanted to, they couldn't have, because they wouldn't be permitted. Now, their main enemy, according to Palestinian books, is Europe. Europe started the colonialism of, of colonization of Palestine, and Israel is only the last, uh, the last party in this chain. That's how they do it. They also make a point of, of really emphasizing that they are not anti-Jewish. They write with immense respect about Judaism, but they are, they are anti-Zionists. Okay, so they do this. And um, this is the most they can do. So there's no way of comparing. You see what I mean? This whole com comparison is not right. Also, they have one book in each subject. We have hundreds. All right? Um, I don't know what they might have done if they had a chance, but I don't think they would have been busy in demonizing, uh, in demonizing Israel. They have other problems. Okay, all they want is really to get rid of, of this, of this usurper, of this occupier. And it's another technique that you should use, and not, uh, not racism, not racism. You don't find any racism in their, in their, uh, in these books, except for. For example, one of the problems of these books is that they talk in the name of Islam as if there are no Christian Palestinians. So this is one of the problems that they have. They don't include the Bedouins with the Palestinian people. They have other problems. Okay? But this is not their, their, their point. This is not their, uh, their objective to, 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 to demonize or, uh, or to be racist. And they cannot do it if they want to. And the last point, uh, the maps. Okay? Everybody is Scandalized by the maps, and if you look at the maps in Palestinian, uh, my colleague she 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 shows it every time. She said the map that scandalized everybody. It says uh, at the bottom, 1937. So 1937, there was no Israel. Why do you want them to write the state of Israel 1937? But after the foundation of Israel, they they they, they write the land of the Jews. So there are so many myths about it, and the easiest thing is really to go and read these books because they are all translated, because they are so supervised and monitored and so on and so forth. Thank you so much, Nurit. All right. Thank you. Thank you.